afternoon. I almost said it. Good morning, but I didn't. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, everyone is doing well this morning. You know, even with the rain, wasn't that nice just to cool down things and feel refreshed and washed off my patio? I didn't have to do it. All those things. All right, for your announcements this morning, you'll notice on the back, um, our worship design won't meet until September 5th, but if you'd like to join us some Tuesday when we do that, please do, please come. Uh, council meeting the next Sunday, September 10th, after worship, and again, we invite you to come. If you'll mark on your calendars the UWF um, on Saturday, October 7th, we'll have their fall rummage sale. We finally got it down on our schedule. So we need you to start cleaning out your closets. Again, you know, it's like, what? Just do another closet, right? That's what you do. Um, so anyway, we'd appreciate anything that you'd like to bring. We can place in our Sunday school room or sometimes in the um, the. I call it the UMW, I'm sorry, room, but it's best if we can put it in the Sunday school room until we have our rummage cell. So, um, any other things that we need to mention today? Yes, Gail? Oh, yeah. Yes, she brought cucumbers, so they'll go great in your salads, or just to eat them. I love to eat them like apple, apples. They're so good. So, yes, yeah, she's laid them out on the table, and she made sure they're clean, and they look real pretty. Take a few and enjoy. Yes, this time of year is so much fun with gardens, right? With all the stuff that comes out, the good stuff. That's what we're known for in Idaho, right? The good stuff. All right. Any others? Any I, other? I have been made aware that Tuesday is somebody's birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. Who would that be? I don't know, but I think they're... I, 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 I was just informed that apparently that person likes to eat cucumbers like apples. Yes, I do. That, yeah, that person is that person's birthday. <laughs> yeah, it's another year I'd like to forget. <laughs> But it, it was a good year, but I just I can't believe I'm that old. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you much. Yeah, they come and go so fast. But, you know, I don't feel the age. It's just the number, right? That's right. So thank you, though. Appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> Aaron's soccer team is selling gift cards to the sandwich company. Oh. They're $20. I think she has two left. So if anybody wants to go to the sandwich company. <laughs> I'll take one. That's so, a good place to eat. Yeah. Yum, yum. All right. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> first come, first serve. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, Erin had her first game. So just got her first game under the belt and. It's that time of year. I know Jackson's been excited for football, and they had a jamboree, and they beat um, Highland and one other school, and he was really excited about that. So hopefully they'll have a great season. And I know that, um, what's your name, Matthew? <laughs> I know that you're excited for your season, but how's the knee? I forgot to add you to our prayers last week. Two more weeks, and then you're raring to go again. Yeah, and classes went well. No. Yeah, I've heard that from a few people, but 
Yeah, Kimberly starts this week. So, Natalie, have you started yet? Tomorrow. And that same thing with Jess starting tomorrow for college in the big wigs now. Ooh. And Aaron, how did your schedule go? Good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well, school is always exciting. Tell you the truth, it is. I always loved school. There were times, you know, but. Love those kids. Always fit in well with them. Former bus driver tells you to watch out for kids and buses. Oh, yes. When I've delivered my granddaughter to school in the mornings, they just dart. They don't even see you. And it's like, Ugh. yeah. I go very, very slow and watch every direction because, yeah, it's scary. There's so many, and I know our bus drivers, too, there's been such a shortage all over the nation. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. So please lift up our schools, our kids, our teachers, our bus drivers, even the janitors. We were talking about janitorial stuff this morning. So, you know, you guys miss out on fellowship. If you're not here for fellowship early before church, you miss out on all of our conversations. We try to solve a lot of problems <laughs> with God's help, right? And yeah, oh yeah, we had bread and, and apricot preserves this morning, ooh, ooh, and cookies. You know, we've got good cooks. So, well, I see the pastor roaming around somewhere out there. I think she does this. She... <laughs> Anyway, but no more announcements. We're ready to go with our opening hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. That is a great hymn. If you feel like standing, please do so. If you feel like shaking a leg, do so. Let's get ready for worship. Let's join together in our call to worship. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity.
It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Amen. Oh, you may be seated. Sorry. Come running in at the last minute, and it's already starting to have to catch up with where we are. Bring <laughs> here. No, we're glad you made it. Yep, yep. How's mom doing? to go camping. Well, that's yeah. good news. Good. Yep. Good. Or I should say glamping. They don't camp the way I do. Oh, I, yeah, glamping. <laughs> yeah. I know how that goes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and Matthew, only two weeks to go with a kneecap. <laughs> well, you're practicing for school, right? Yeah, I thought so. You get him in trouble already, Mari. Mm-hmm. What do we say about that? Well, we're just talking. We're, I'm glad it's only two weeks. You'll be ready to go. Yeah, hopefully. Do that physical therapy. Yes, yes. Any other? I well, have, oh, go ahead. I have two, actually. Okay. One, of course, I'll be starting my first day of college tomorrow. Woo-hoo. And just various other, everyone else with school, just that I think yes. needs prayers. And then the second thing, I'm having another friend um, who's leaving on their mission named Brayden, and he'll be going to a city in Brazil. Ooh. And of all the people, <laughs> he, he, he'll need some prayers <laughs> because the city also has a very large robbery rate. So I, oh. ho- I pray for his safety. Yes, for sure. So Brandon was Braden. Was he the one that was here with Logan? No. no. So that one was Jeff. Okay, I couldn't remember. I was going to call him Aaron just in <laughs> case. You know, the alias. Sorry, Aaron. He got your name tag that one day. That's another story. But anyway, yeah. So prayers for him. Yes. Does he know Spanish? I do not believe so. Or Portuguese. Well, Portuguese okay. Oh, Spanish. I don't think he knows that either. <laughs> Spanish so. would help. Well, sort of like English doesn't help either, does it? <laughs> well, I didn't. Know. I just had to be a smart aleck. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that, that's trivia. I happen to know. <laughs> yeah, learn something every day, don't we? So, as a concern and a plug um, for Umcor. Um, I'm yes. sure you've been watching the news, all of the horrors unfolding with all of the different natural disasters happening between the hurricane oh, <laughs> coming yeah. for California, the flooding in Alaska, and especially those wildfires in Maui. That was just, that was apocalyptic, seeing people's um, cell phone footage of them having to flee into the ocean, and even then they were still succumbing to the, the smoke, and um, just a horrible, horrible situation. And I know that when it seems like there's just one disaster after another, it gets overwhelming, and we run the risk of having compassion fatigue because, you know, individually, we're all just one person. How much can we do? You know, it is exhausting. Um, But this is where UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, is so important. Um, Church apportionments pay for the administration costs, So all of the overhead is covered by us. That way, when someone makes a donation, whether it's to the general fund for UMCOR or to a specific cause for UMCOR, you know 100% of your donation is going to the people in need. Um, So you don't have to worry about going to pay some suit and tie somewhere in some plush office. You know the people who need it get it. So if you would like to make a donation to help, as one person, we can't do a lot. Um, But when we team up with each other from all around the world, we can make miracles happen. So even if all you can give is $5 to one of the natural disaster funds, that $5 will go a long way when it's it's combined with everyone else's $5. So you can go to umcore.org and be able to make your donation right there online. You can even allow it to be attributed to our church so we get... uh, uh, credit for it along with you, and that makes our church look good. So, so by all means, if you would like to find a way to help those in need, but you just don't know where to start, start with UMCOR. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, our UFW uh, discussed that too, 
and giving. And also, we made those kits, some of those kits. So, yeah, the paperwork's out there for those making the kits. We need to make more because those are given. And I'm sure they need everything. They lost everything. So, yeah. Miss Kathy. Um, l last Tuesday before our church, so a week ago Tuesday, I think it was the 10th, or I don't know what day Something it was, like um, we got noticed that my sister's brother-in-law, who mom has been a really good friend with all of these years, his name is Dick Rice, was, matter of fact, from Haines to Anchorage with bleeding in the brain. And uh, he's had, they had a surgery and they got him under control within that time period. He has been, on, he was unconscious for a week in the hospital. And um, then we found out later after that week and he started, started to respond with hands and his eyes hadn't opened for like a week. Um, found out that he had surgery yesterday. Again, he has a tumor on the brain. They weren't able to get it all, so they're going to have to do chemo and radiation on him. He is 71 years old, and he had just finished uh, the year previous uh, a long-term battle with cancer of the throat. So uh, oh this, this man is a person that has taught Arctic safety, Arctic survival. Um, he's been an EMT all his life. He's so dynamic. It's such a wonderful person. And, not that we aren't all, but um, he's a special person in our lives. And so I would ask for prayer for him. Uh, upcoming, more, I don't, they're not going to do any more surgeries on him, but a long rehabilitation and um, it's kind of devastating. So yes. thank you. And you said Dick, right? Dick Rice, yes. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, Dick Rice. Definitely. We'll lift up Dick Rice with. All that's going on with him. Yes, Barb. Well, <clears throat> speaking of disasters, and I haven't heard too much about it, but the big fires up around Spokane, Rob and Karen, my son and daughter-in-law, were here this weekend, Ooh. and another uh, person uh, Rob works with called to let him know the third person lost their home, and they got out with the clothes on their back and their two dogs. Oh, and out of 30 homes in the subdivision, the lady, uh, Nikki said, 24 of them burned to the ground. And see, there hasn't been, there was just a little bit on the news last night. But anyway, keep those people up in yes. the round Spokane in your prayers. Right. Yeah, I, I know that Russ Mitchell, who was the principal here several years ago at Kimberly Elementary, Barb and him are also have a home that's in the mountain areas, and I'm hoping that all is well. I need to text them and see, but yeah, it's that's crazy. And then also Canada, all of those people that lost, yeah, had to be leaving their homes. So it's crazy. <laughs> it truly is. Clothes on their backs. Ugh. No warning. And, and it, something about fire, it's just, ugh, goes, yeah, it's scary, very scary. Lots of prayers for those going through the fires of different places, so, yes. I'm sure UMCOR will be there, though, too. That's a wonderful thing about our church with the UMCOR. They do a lot of good, good. Any others concerns? Yes, Gail. John's, Summerlin's niece, nieces uh -huh. yesterday, as they live, and his, and his brother live in Oceanside, California. And that is where that hurricane is going. Uh, I didn't hear about it, how, where it was this morning, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a big old so. hurricane going up the uh, coast of California. And it, this rain evidently was part, of, part that. of that effect. So prayers for those families in that hurricane. Oh, yes. A lot so of thank them. you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes, hurricane, winds, fire, you name it. Yeah. 
for sure, for sure. You know, the last one that occurred in California, I think they mentioned was 1939. Yeah, I didn't know there would ever be one on the West Coast, but surprise, surprise. History. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, any others? Well, it's just a joy to be together here worshiping our wonderful Father, and I know he hears our prayers, and he's in more control than we can be, so let's lift our prayers to him. Let us pray. Almighty Father, you are so, so good. Even in all of this, we know that you're with each and every one of us. We mean everything to you. You sent your only son to die for us, to cleanse us of our sins, and with that, we have hope for life eternal. But all these individuals, no matter if it's disease, um, fires, hurricane, whatever it is, we know that you're with them and you're with us today. As we pray to you, you hear our prayers. And there is healing, and there is miracles that happen all the time. So for whatever reason, will you please, Lord, be with them today. Put your loving arms around them. Let them know that all will be well. It will take some time, but you are with them. And for all of us in this room today, for maybe not sharing something in our hearts about someone going through something, we know, too, there are many, many joys, many miracles we see. With our harvest time and all of the wonderful weather we have been experiencing and the rain that we had last night, what a wonderful joy just to have you in control of everything. We pray, Lord, for all of these individuals and for all of us in this church as well as our pastor today. May we truly understand and begin to know that you have the Holy Spirit filling us with your love and joy and that you too truly listen to prayers and help us in every way. We pray for our leadership, for the military, for all the loved ones and friends that we have that may be traveling or may be ill or for those that are going through such horrible things of losses, but with their life being spared, let them know that you will help them build even more and better for themselves. Oh, Father God, we lift them all up to you. We lift ourselves up to you, and we ask for your healing and your love to continue, plus your wisdom and guidance. For the schools that are opening up and that have been going with the athletics, with the bus drivers, with the medical crew, all of us need your help. You are the Almighty Father. You are the power of all. You can do everything for us, but you leave a lot to us to work for so that we do understand what it is like to be with Jesus. Oh, Father God, I just pray just as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father.
All right, our scripture today is taken from Matthew 15, 21 through 28, the New International Version. The faith of a Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and su suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she cried. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Natalie was so eager to take this home last week, it makes me nervous to know what she wanted to put in it. So I thought about giving it to you again, Renee. You did it the last time Natalie put something in there. So, yeah. You, you, you want to do it? <laughs> All right, let's see what she did to me. Oh, it is a useless remote. <laughs> because it goes to a smart TV, and there's no smart TV here, and it's only as smart as the person who uses it. <laughs> um, hmm. So it's a Roku TV remote and for you. Um, yeah. Um, 
Sometimes I wish I had one of these for her. <laughs> when she gets to rattling one about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Spider-Man, I wish I could be like, <clears throat> it doesn't work though. <laughs> She's going to see the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie with her uncle after church today. So I'm gonna have to hear nonstop about it all week, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, <laughs> remote control. <laughs> Some of us kind of treat God like we think that we have a remote control and that, you know, when we need something from God, we can just push the right button and get it back. Um, when we don't have time for God, we just push pause and walk away, um, you know. <laughs> and so a lot of us do. We, we treat faith like a remote control. I remember a seminary professor talking about how people treat, treat prayer like it's a vending machine. You put in so much prayer and you get something out in return. And, he, he, you know, he's like, you can't treat prayer like that. And so you can't treat faith like a remote control. God is not someone that we can turn on and off at our will. You know, I admit I like to watch TV. In the evenings, I've, I've got a remote just like this. <laughs> and in the evenings, I'll sit there and I'll look through all of the different streaming services I have and find just what's perfect for me to watch that night. And, you know, it's convenient having something at your fingertips that you can control that way. But God can't be controlled. <laughs> And so we have to remember that, that God is our remote control. God controls us, <laughs> not the other way around. And so we need to be people who are responding to God, who are you know, acknowledging that God is with us at all times, that we don't get to pick and choose when we're going to follow God, when we're not. Um, you know, we don't get to pick and choose you know, something for our schedule. Um, that's the great thing I love about smart TVs. It's all of my entertainment works around my schedule. <laughs> I don't have to be home at prime time to watch something now. I can watch it anytime I want. But I have to treat God as something bigger than that. And so let remote controls remind you that we can't treat God the way we treat our things here on this earth. We have to treat God with more dignity, more re respect, more honor and glory than that. So thank you, Natalie. I was nervous. I thought you were going to give me something like really weird. To be honest, I assumed it was going to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle themed. <laughs> so if I keep, if I keep, did I, did I see your, did your hand go up or are you just scratching? Did you want it? <laughs> Not he wants it. <laughs> okay. Do, do you need this for your TV? Yes. Does your TV not work if you don't have this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she made a mistake. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wouldn't actually do that because she knows where I live. <laughs> yeah, she would annoy me. <laughs> the summer I put up ring doorbell cameras, you know, with the motion detector cameras on them. Um, I got all kinds of weird videos from her, so I know how much she can harass a person. <laughs> and even though she's of Mexican descent, she would come and she would leave Spanish language messages on my ring camera, and they were terrible Spanish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let us go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, you are the potter and we are the clay, so make us and mold us in your image today. And may the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, first of all, I have to give <laughs> Janet an apology. I forgot to tell you that I changed the title of the, the sermon, after all, because I gave them a list, the worship committee, a list of the working titles, like, two months ago, you know. <laughs> and so things change sometimes. And I also didn't realize I had a typo in the original title. It was supposed to say Hearts and Sewers, but in my notes I wrote, wrote, wrote Hearts and Sewers. <laughs> I don't know where my mind was there. So not only did I give her the wrong title, I gave her a title with a typo in it. And she was probably wondering what in the world I was going to be preaching about today. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so by now, I, I know you've realized we're focusing on miracles. The past few weeks, we've been looking at, at miracle stories and how we are called to be active participants in miracle working in our world. You know, you've seen the sermon titles, even when I give the wrong ones. <laughs> you've seen the graphics. That, oh my gosh, that is so cute. It's a pit bull puppy. That's my favorite breed. <laughs> okay, I just noticed that, sorry. <laughs> you've seen the graphics that, <laughs> that Clarence worked so hard to put together for us. And you've heard the stories the past couple of weeks. You know, the feeding of the 5,000, that's a definite miracle story, right? I mean... It defies logic and scientific explanation. And even, even when we try to assign logic to it, when we try to explain it away, the moment we take into account human nature, we realize it still defies explanation. And that's a textbook explanation of a miracle. And then there's the walking on the water story. I mean, that's a miracle if I've ever heard of one. No one, no human being can walk on water. Our bodies are simply not designed to be able to do that. The rules of physics prevent it. And yet, we saw that not only did Jesus walk on water, but so did Peter. Well, he did for a minute anyway until he got distracted by the world. But for a minute, he was a part of the miracle. It's not hard to see where those stories of our faith are indeed miracle stories. But you're probably struggling to figure out how the story of the Canaanite woman arguing with Jesus is a miracle. <laughs> and sure enough, if you look for, you know, to, to the scholars throughout history and you look at the list that has been compiled over the millennia by the, you know, the Bible's greatest scholars, this story is not going to appear in a list of Jesus' miracles. Probably the only list you will find it listed as a miracle in is my list, and I am no scholar. Oh, see, that's where you guys are supposed to say, oh, no, Pastor, you're so smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. <laughs> so to understand why I view this as a miracle... We have to look at the historical aspects of the people who are involved in this story. So first, we'll start with the Canaanite woman. And I told the other church this, and I'll tell you this too, because that way you guys can make fun of the way I talk. But in West Virginia, it's not pronounced Canaan. It's pronounced Canaan. We have a Canaan Valley, spelled the same way. It's Canaan. So I always struggled with that when I was a kid. <laughs> All right, so, so we start with the Canaanite woman. She is, you know, she has all of these obstacles to what she is trying to do. And so we'll start with the most obvious obstacle that she has. And that is simply that she is a woman. And now I know that by modern standards, we don't consider that much of an obstacle, I know. But in her world, she was considered less than human. Romans and Greeks actually had philosophies that their most powerful and educated leaders adhered to that said women were devoid of any intellect and soul. <laughs> they viewed women as little more than a vessel for men to be able to, to gain male heirs from. That was their whole purpose and that was their only purpose. So a woman in that day and time would have only been valuable by her ability to produce male heirs for her husband. So to have a conversation with a woman was already absurd, they thought, and to expect a woman to be able to produce an argument that could change the mind of an established and respected teacher, that was utterly laughable. She was quite literally, in her day and time and in her culture, a nobody. The culture of their time said she was not supposed to approach Jesus, especially while he's working as a teacher of the faith. Now, her husband might have been permitted to, but even that's a little iffy for reasons we'll get into in a minute. But we don't see her husband anywhere in the story. We don't really know what the deal with that is. Maybe she's a widow, maybe she's divorced, maybe her, she has a husband and he just doesn't have the same faith she does in this. We really don't know what's going on there. 
but he is not present. And so she, who should be keeping silent and keeping away from the teacher, dares to approach a teacher of the faith. And this would have been utterly scandalous, not just for her. It would have scandalized her for sure, but it would have also scandalized Jesus. And yet it happens. Inexplicably, it happens. And now the argument here would be that any mother would find the courage to break social norms and risk ostracizing herself for their child, right? I mean, any woman would. And I tend to agree with that. You know, I have never known a mother here in this modern world that I live in that wouldn't defy every single social convention there is to save her child from a terrible illness such as the demons that were possessing this woman's child. You know, a mother would go to any length to save her child. But this is not happening in the modern world. This is happening in the ancient world, and the child in question is a daughter, a woman in the making. So, you know, children weren't really considered humans either, but boys at least held the value of knowing they would grow into men. This one was going to grow into a woman. And therein lies the second obstacle, because it brings us right back to where we started from, with all of the understandings of her time and place, telling her that she is not worth the time and the effort. This is a woman, a nobody, approaching a teacher with crowds of men around him to appeal to him about a little girl, another nobody. And this is utterly astounding for their day and time. You know, there would have been an audible gasp at her audacity. How dare she act so brashly? What kind of upbringing did this woman have to have that she thought this kind of behavior was okay? No wonder the disciples implored Jesus to send her away. This woman, this woman who must be an embarrassment even to her own parents, needed to be put in her place. And here we run into the the third obstacle this woman faces, because her parents are clearly Canaanites, because she herself is a Canaanite. Her ancestors would have been Canaanite. She is not a member of the tribe of Israel by any stretch of the imagination. So she was not a good little Jewish girl. She was an outsider. She was part of the people who so often caused Israel so much grief and woe. She was a problem. She had no right to approach a teacher of Israel No right to come to him and ask him for any type of miracle or grace. This, this that he was teaching, what he was offering, it was not for her. And yet she asks. She asks knowing that she will be a source of disgust to the people who are around Jesus. She asks knowing that she is likely to be rejected by her own people for turning to an Israelite for help. She asks risking everything, risking what little source of safety and security a woman of her time could possibly have. She asks anyway. And who does she ask? Well, that's the fourth obstacle she's facing, and it brings us to the second character in the story, to Jesus. You see, it's an obstacle because Jesus is an Israelite, and not just an Israelite. Jesus is from the very line of David. So that means he is as entrenched in Jewish culture and customs and heritage as one can possibly be. He is, you know, the most Jewish Jew there is. <laughs> and he's not just entrenched in Jewish life. He's a teacher of Jewish life and faith. A teacher who is highly sought after by this point in his ministry. I mean, he raises the dead. He makes the lame to walk. He gives the blind sight. He is a source of hope and joy and a world of misery and sorrow. And he is kind, he is wise, and he is gentle, but with an authority that can calm the seas and the raging storms. And that's how she heard about him. A woman who normally didn't pay attention to Jewish teachers had heard about this preacher, this healer, this miracle worker. 
The problem was Jesus' culture and customs dictated that he should not interact with women, and on top of that, he should not interact with Canaanites. So he especially should not be interacting with a Canaanite woman. He would be made impure just by her presence, or so the people thought. He wasn't there to teach a woman like this, or so the people thought. And he wasn't there for her type, for her race, for Canaanites, or so the people thought. He was theirs, they said. He was theirs, and they did not want to share him with anyone else. And Jesus knew all of this when she came up to him. He knew how this would be whispered about in every synagogue throughout Israel and in the temple in Jerusalem itself. He knew how some people would shake their heads and walk away from him at this point and say, well, this just isn't the preacher I thought he was. He knew that some would argue with him and would say, but this grace is not for her type. He knew that some would be disappointed in him for even engaging with her, and yet others would be so angry that they would be driven to murderous intent by it. And yet he risked everything to engage with her. Now to fully understand how this is a miracle story, we would be remiss to ignore the tertiary characters. In, in our world of movies and, and films and TV, we would call them extras. The extras in this particular film, or if it was a Greek play, they would be the chorus, you know, that little group of people that would walk around the stage and they would all say the exact same thing to set the, the, the context. Surely you remember that from high school English classes, right? Having to read you know, Oedipus Rex or whatever. And, <laughs> and so, so they were the chorus. They were the extras. They were the ones who were just kind of setting the context for the rest of us. You know, and they are the chorus of voices who hear this woman beseeching Jesus and following him through the streets, and they complain to Jesus and say, send her away. She is a nuisance. You see, when she cried out, they could not hear her pleas for compassion. When she cried out, they could not hear her agony. They could not hear her grief. And when they looked at her, they did not see her humanity. They couldn't see her value. They didn't see her love for her daughter. They could only hear and see an outsider who was annoying them. And so they sang out to Jesus in harmony, send her away. Send her away, she's bothering us. And this is where the miracle begins to happen. Because Jesus, who is fully divine, but is also, as we know from the mystery of our faith, fully human, and he has been raised as a human by humans amongst humans in a human world, and so he was told all of the same things that we get told. You know, he was told that, that what he was was only meant for some and not for all. He would cast off all of those limitations that had been imposed upon him and show us all a more perfect way. He would defy the social norms from virtually every nation known on earth at that time, and he would speak with a woman, a woman. He would give a woman a chance to present her argument before all these men and change a teacher's mind. This was absurd for this world. And so, in a true miracle that defied any logic of his time, that defied any known rationale of his world, that defied the very core of the customs of his own people, Jesus turned and began a philosophical discussion with a Canaanite woman. Now, I don't know, I, I am kind of a nerd, so I do enjoy philosophical discussions, but I've been told by a lot of people who aren't as nerdy as me that they really don't like them, that, that they find them tedious and boring, and, and you know, it's, they, they just don't want to deal with it. Just shut up, Amanda, and go home, you know? And, <laughs> and so, so a lot of people don't want to engage in this, and here's this woman who's been told her whole life that she doesn't have an intellect to be able to have a philosophy. But Jesus engages 
in this philosophical discussion with this Canaanite woman in front of all of these Jewish men, and she argues that even the dogs under the table get to eat the scraps. And she knew that the scraps of Christ's mercy, the crumbs that would fall from what was left over, she knew that would be enough. That's all she needed. She was humble enough, just like the woman who, who knew if she could just quietly touch his hem that everything would be okay. She knew she didn't need it all. She just needed a crumb. She didn't need the feast. He could keep that for Israel for all she cared. She just wanted the crumbs. She could make do with the dog's share. And this was for her daughter. She was not above getting on her hands and knees to lap up the crumbs from the ground. She was happy to do that. And so her boldness, her brashness, her humility, and her faith that the mercy of Christ, that the mercy that Christ was showing to his own people could be applied to her as well, could be applied to her and her daughter, that was enough for her. It was more than enough. And he brought her not just crumbs, he brought her to the feast and he gave her everything she needed, not just the scraps. And that day, a brand new understanding was born, something that would later drive the disciples themselves to venture beyond the constraints of their own understanding and carry the gospel to Gentile lands and beyond. And that is a miracle that would bring Christ's grace to you and me all these years later, because I'm sure like me, most if not all of you know that you can't trace your, your lineage back to Judaism. It just isn't going to happen. So if this miracle hadn't happened that Jesus had brought her in to this moment and given her this chance to show her faith, my ancestors wouldn't have had the story of the gospel to pass down to me. It is a miracle. And it is a miracle that we are all called to live into. Because if we were going to, if this, if this story was being told today, in this day, in this age, in this setting, I'm going to tell you that when the cast is set, we're going to be the disciples. We're going to be the extras. We're going to be that, that chorus of voices over on the side. And we have to decide what we're going to say. Because the very disciples of Jesus said, she's a nuisance, send her away. This isn't for her. Let's exclude her. We are the disciples in this story. And we are being asked when we hear of this miracle where a Canaanite woman was brought in to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, we are being asked to stop and to listen to the miracle that is happening before us. Because this is, an, is a miracle of inclusion in a world that is bent on excluding certain people. So we have to ask ourselves, we have to stop and ponder where we are in this story, and we have to ask, we have to ask who we would tell Jesus to send away. Who would we say, they're bothering us, get rid of them. Just tell them to go away. This isn't for them. Who have we limited Christ's mercy and compassion to? Who have we been guilty of gatekeeping at the church doors? The miracle here is that Jesus came to save even those people, the ones that we would push away and call a nuisance. Jesus came to save them the same way Jesus came to save us, even when we were outsiders beyond the con cultural concept of acceptable, when we were being treated as little more than stray dogs. You know, I've done the genealogy in my family alongside with my mother, and we know that our family came to the United States, her, her ancestors came to the United States to begin with seeking religious freedom. Because when they were living in Europe, they were constantly being chased because of their brand of Christianity. They were being called heretics and being chased back and forth between Germany and Holland. And, and they finally got tired of constantly being uprooted from their lives and forced to leave that they picked up and they got on a boat with William Penn and they came to the U.S., and now you're stuck with me. And so, <laughs> so I know from the, the stories within my own family that there were times when we were just stray dogs, but Christ loved us enough to bring us in. 
And Christ loves those we would push away the same way. So who do we need to start listening to? Who do we need to give space to? Who do we need to become a part of this miracle of inclusion to? Who do we need to go out and carry the truth of the gospel to? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves when we hear about the miracle of Jesus healing the Canaanite's daughter. Amen. Find where I am. Okay. Before we go to the prayer of confession, I'm going to make my own confession before you. And forgive me, this got longer than I expected at the Gooding Church. Um, <laughs> usually when I do my evening walks, I listen to an audible book while I'm walking. And recently I listened to a book called Out Love that was written by a woman who was raised in a very conservative Christian family, very conservative Christian family. Um, and she loved Jesus from the time she was a kid. She always loved Jesus so much. But when she was 12, she realized she was gay, and she told her mother, who reacted with utter horror at this. And so her mother enrolled her in a young person's ex-gay ministry, and the girl began a lifetime of trying to reconcile her sexuality and her faith. And for the longest time, they kept telling her, you need to be straight. You need to be straight. You need to get into a straight relationship and do this and do that. And so she grew up trying to live in to this reality. And then when she was in college, she became involved in Exodus International, which was the world's biggest ex-gay ministry, or was at the time, it's now defunct. And she traveled all over the country sharing her testimony. But in the end, when she began to realize that she wasn't any less gay, that that wasn't the choice she had before her to make, that all she had to make was how she would live her life faithfully, And around that same time, the leader of Exodus was beginning to realize that nearly everyone he had coached was still wrestling with being a homosexual. And he realized he was doing more harm than good by trying to tell them, go out and force yourself into this straight marriage. He realized he was hurting more people that way. And that's when Exodus folded. But she was still so in love with Jesus and she just wanted to serve him. And so she wound up getting a job at Wheaton College, kind of the, it's the Harvard of conservative Christian colleges. It is a great college. Um, She got a job as an assistant to the chaplain because the evangelical church was also beginning to realize that you don't get to choose if you're gay or straight, but you do get to choose how you live. And so they were beginning to press this idea that, you know, it's okay if you're gay, but you still have to subscribe to traditional ideas of marriage and and so forth. And so she adhered to that and she became their spokesperson. But she began to feel over time that she was manipulated because every time she would try to hold the church accountable, then she would get silenced. When people attacked her, they refused to stand up for her, even though they said they were celebrating her. And so she began to hold the church accountable for the fact that they were not being the family God intended them to be for her and other gay Christians. And she was really holding the church's feet to the fire in this book toward the end, let me tell you. I was walking and I, I, through town, talking to myself out loud as I'm, <laughs> as I'm listening to this book. It was just one of those really profound things. But one of the things she said that will always stick with me, she said, gay people can live without sex. They cannot live without intimacy. They need a family. They need to have more than just an hour a week where they are welcomed. They need to be sitting around your tables, sharing in your holidays. They need to be a part of your family, and the church has to be their family. That if we're going to tell them they can't marry and can't have their own family, by golly, we got to be that. And she is just holding holding our feet to the fire on that. And I just enjoyed her perspective so much on hearing her say, you know, you claim you're being inclusive now, but you're still pushing us out. You're still killing us. This is why we have the highest rate of, of suicide in the world is because we are being excluded from families. Our mo- her mother wound up pretty much disowning her. Her brothers refused to let her you know, come around because they have children and they don't want her influence around. Mind you, her influence is as an active Christian woman. <laughs> 
in leadership roles in churches, but that wasn't good enough. No matter what she did, it was never good enough. And so I read this, and now if you guys know me very well, you know I have no problem <laughs> welcoming and including LGBT people into the life of the church. You know I have no problem with that. However, the book did force me to look at some of the people I push out of the way, and it caused me to hold myself accountable to something that happened in my home church years ago. And this is something, I don't think any of you will condemn me for my reaction to this, because I think most people would have the same reaction. But there was a family that our SPRC chair decided, our SPRC committee decided they were going to hire the mother in the family to be our new church pianist, even though they knew there was this history. You see, the mother and the father, and there were five children in the family, the mother and the father were both teachers in the next county over. They had also been in charge of the choir in the large church in the next county over. The husband was arrested for sexually abusing two of his students. Okay. Horrendous crime. The SPRC committee decided the wife and the children still need a place to be. They're, it's not their fault. They didn't commit this crime. And they had been fired from their position in the church that they had served, even though she committed no crime herself. They were being, they, they were just, it was horrible. Like people would drive by and shout at the children, call them pedophiles, even though they were just kids themselves and it wasn't their fault what their father had done. And so the SPRC committee hires her knowing that while we're waiting for him to go to trial, he's going to be coming to church with her as well. And therein lied the rub. We were expected as a church to make room for a pedophile. And it nearly split our church. I'm not gonna lie, I was against this from the get-go. I was appalled. I was uh, directing the, the children's ministry at the time. I was leading youth groups. I was uh, organizing Sunday schools. I was teaching Sunday schools and vacation Bible schools. I was around children all the time. And the idea that now I'm gonna have to watch out for this guy was utterly appalling to me. And I was so angry. It's like, let his wife come, let his children come, but that man can't come. <laughs> Our doors are closed to that man. And the SBRC committee said, we've already worked out. We brought in the, the sheriff, we brought in a lawyer, and we have sat down with the family and we have, or the parents, and we have worked out a plan of action to keep everyone safe. He will always be supervised by a mentor every time he's in the building. He won't be allowed to use the group bathrooms. He will have to use the pastor's individual bathroom. He, you know, he's not going to be allowed even in the education wing because our church was like in a horseshoe. So like one side of the horseshoe was the education wing. He wasn't even allowed over there. You know, he wasn't even allowed in the connecting hall that connected <laughs> the education wing to the worship wing. You know, that wasn't good enough. I didn't want him there. I did not want him there. Now, I never told his children that because his children were in the groups that I was leading as a young adult. And so I just welcomed the kids, but oh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I hated that man. I hated seeing him come. I hated that he was allowed to be around his own kids. I hated that he was allowed to be in our church. I despised him. My nephew was a baby at the time, and I remember him making the comment about what a cute baby he was, and I got so infuriated. <laughs> How dare he look at this baby, <laughs> you know? I was so mad, so mad. His kids and I have stayed friends all these years. They're grown now, and his oldest daughter I still talk to at least weekly, and about a year ago, I was talking to her, and she said, you know, I just have to thank you, because when everything hit, it was so hard, and your church really just kind of welcomed us in. And it moved me to tears, not out of joy that we had done what was right, but because I realized how hard I fought to keep a part of her family away. And keeping a part of her family away might have kept her away too. And I realized that it was only by the grace of God and this pure miracle that the SPRC chair had more grace for this man than I ever did. And it forced me to reconsider things. You know, I don't think anyone would blame me for being angry that a pedophile was wanting to come into, you know, a, a confessed one at that. You know, he, he confessed his crimes and I wasn't willing to show him grace. 
I wasn't willing to say, hey, I can be your sister in Christ as you struggle to figure out how to tame these urges in the future, as you struggle to learn how to balance your faith with who you are so that you don't harm anyone else again. I didn't do the right thing. Looking back, I still don't know entirely what the right thing was. I just know that how I reacted was poorly. And so this is my confession to you, because we all have those places where we would happily exclude someone from the life of our church. And chances are, if you say who those people are, a lot of people around you are going to nod and say, yeah, us too. We wouldn't want them here either. <laughs> so don't think you're as horrible as that, you know, that, that, that you can't speak those out loud and, and say, because, you know, as a society, we do have people we want to keep out. We do that. But Christ teaches us a bigger, better way. Christ's mercy and Christ's grace is bigger than our societal need for vengeance and wrath. And I don't have all of the answers. These are things we have to wrestle together as a Christian family. We have to work them out together. We have to figure them out together. But one thing I know is we have to open the doors together. I don't know because I never engaged in any, that's my confession, I never engaged in any kind of relationship with him to know. I don't know where his heart is in that. I know that he always went to church, even after he got out of prison. He, yeah, but most of us weren't, weren't curious about that because we just didn't want a pedophile in the midst of us. And so that was, and unfortunately that's the reality that we deal with as churches. There are people that are outcasts that we don't want around us. You know, and we can be inclusive towards certain people, and we can, we can pat ourselves on the back and say we're such a loving group, but there's always going to be that one person that... Well, no, no, that is true. <laughs> but people don't get to the point of repentance without the church. That's what Christ did was he made it possible for, you know, it used to be the priests controlled, and if you didn't meet the proper requirements for repentance and purity you didn't get in the temple, Christ changed all of that. And so I'm right back to wrestling with the same thing. How do we decide when to keep them out and when to let them in? You know, so yeah, it, it, it's a wrestle. It's, there's no easy answers to any of that. But we have to wrestle with that. And that's what I hope you hear when you read, when you hear this story and you see how Christ brought the Canaanite woman in that Canaanite woman would have been as reviled amongst the Jews as a pedophile is amongst us. So they wouldn't have wanted their children around a Canaanite woman. They wouldn't have wanted that influence <laughs> around their families. They didn't want their sons to grow up and marry a woman like her. You know, she was reviled. And so that's, you know, we, we do the same thing. We, we have our people that we revile as well. And Christ is challenging us. If we're not being challenged when we hear Christ's words, we're not really listening. <laughs> so, so listen deeply, think deeply. And as we go to our, our prayer of confession, I just wanted to offer my confession out loud to you so that you could see how this plays out in real life. And I think you all can probably relate to what my apprehension was about this man. You know, so I, I, I feel pretty certain none of you are going to condemn me for my reaction but I know now that how I reacted was not Christ-like. Um, so as we go to our prayer confession, think about those people that you would exclude and, and allow Christ to begin to enter your heart here today. Precious Jesus, your very name makes our hearts swell with hope, love, and pride. We know that through you we have found a place in eternal glory and we can't help, can't help but praise your name and worship you with all our body and soul. Praise Jesus. Thank you for the grace and mercy that goes forth from you. But while we rejoice in the thrill of salvation, we have been guilty of closing the doors to others. We judge the lives of others harshly. We reject them as outsiders who have no place in this sacred space. Help 
Help us to remember that we were once like dogs begging for scraps at your table, and you treated us with dignity and gave us a feast. May we be as bold as the Canaanite woman who came seeking Jesus even when others would turn her away. May our faith be as strong and as confident. May we always see our salvation in Jesus and may we never stop rejoicing in his presence. Now is the time where we share the joys and the, cons- uh, the, not the joys and the concerns, we already did that. We, we share the blessings God has given us, or some of them anyway, uh, through the form of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Go to our Lord in the spirit of thanksgiving. Creator and architect of the universe, we want to believe that your love for us means you will go before us on life's path and clear the way, making it easy to travel, but our experience doesn't always bear that out. We know you see a bigger picture than we do. As we bring you our offerings this day, we affirm your presence with us in the pits of despair as well as in the palaces of plenty. We give with gratitude in Christ's holy name. Amen. And our closing hymn is an oldie but a goodie. (laughs) Onward, Christian soldiers.
up until I was an adult, having grown up in Appalachia. I never heard that if outside of it being played as a bluegrass song. And I remember being astounded the first time I went to a church in Denver as a seminary student, and it wasn't bluegrass. <laughs> I feel like we always need a banjo. I have a banjo if any of you know how to play it. I can't play it. <laughs> All right, we'll go out this week and be a part of the miracle of God's kingdom by welcoming those in who others would keep out. You know, find those who are on the outcast and, and take the gospel to them because they need it just as much as anyone else. And receive this blessing. Beloved, is it fair? As you go today asking this question, remember whether your answer is yes or no, there is always room for more mercy. May we be blessed to be people of God's grace and mercy in a world preoccupied with fairness. Amen.